Have you heard the hype about active recall for faster learning and better memory, but still feel skeptical? Or maybe you've heard the latest learning guru say that this recall method is better than the memory palace technique. Well, if that statement has gotten your hackles up, I can't blame you. After all, the memory palace, when used correctly and understood as just a word for location-based mnemonics, is active recall and self-testing all rolled into one. So, where does the confusion come from? Should you use Anki instead of one of the ancient memory techniques? Are there exercises for improving active recall? Well, if you want information to stick permanently, then stick around. We'll get into the answers to these questions in depth on this video. And this is Anthony Metivier from MagneticMemoryMethod.com, inviting you to get subscribed if you're new here, hit that thumbs up, and enable notifications so you don't miss a thing. So, what is active recall anyway? Well, here's the best scientific definition I've found so far. Active recall is a personalized recall strategy that involves variety. Two words really matter here, personalized and variety. In other words, spaced repetition software might help you use active recall, but it can only help you. Here's what I mean with an example. This morning, I learned Tai Du, it's Mandarin for attitude or manner. And to use active recall and spaced repetition to rapidly place the sound and meaning of this word into my long-term memory, I followed these steps. First, I used a memory palace, and then in the memory palace, I used elaborative encoding. Then I revisited the memory palace to do elaborative decoding. Then I had speaking practice in a sentence, then I did some writing and some reading and some listening to re-encounter that word in different formats. Now, technically, the act of recall part happens only during the attempt to recall the information. However, we know from memory athletes like Boris Conrad that active recall is a lot easier when you use personal associations to encode information. He's a neuroscientist too, so his views are very valuable, and if you haven't heard our conversation on the Magnetic Memory Method podcast, please check it out. Now, another way of looking at the recall part is to use the term retrieval practice. When I recall the association I made in the memory palace for this word, I'm practicing one level of retrieval. Speaking and writing the word are other levels. Pulling up the meaning when hearing the word through listening is yet another level. The reason retrieval practice at multiple levels helps your brain form memories faster is simple. The more levels of recall you engage and the more personal each level is, the faster your brain makes multiple connections. This has been called the levels of processing model and works for just about everyone. Now, people with schizophrenia may struggle, however, no matter how much active recall they perform. The question is, does active recall really work? In a word, yes. The real question is, are you doing it in a deep or shallow way? If you're using Anki or some other flashcard app and not using personalized elaborative encoding, then that is a passive and shallow way to engage. But if you at least make associations for each and every piece of information, your recall rates will soar. Now there is a place for passive memory training and it is shared by Dr. Gary Small, who again was on the Magnetic Memory Method podcast. Don't miss that episode. Very powerful to use passive memory training for its intended purpose. Now one of the key researchers to know about is Dr. Richard Atkinson. He has shown 88% retention rates for those who use elaborative encoding. That's compared to 28% recall for those who don't. You can learn more about why features of human language make this process work and see it reproduced for students with different mother tongues. For example, Dr. Horst Sperber has reproduced these research findings for German speakers with ease. In other words, the language you speak doesn't matter. It's your strategy with this recall method that makes all the difference. So the question isn't really whether or not these techniques work. The question is, how do you make sure you are always using active recall in a personalized, and in a deep way that has variety. So let's talk about some active recall strategies while you're studying. The trick is to learn how to encode quickly. Place the associations you make into memory palaces and then remember to decode using active recall in a multi-level way. Now luckily, all of this can be automated through habit formation. And step one is to have your palette prepared. The first habit to develop is having enough memory palaces and then thinking of them as you learn. To get started with this, make sure you have enough of them. 
and the free course at magneticmerrymethod.com forward slash YT is your guide. Now, when I'm encoding, it takes just a second to think of the memory palace for a word like Taidu. Since its core meaning is attitude, I thought about a lecture hall where I'd seen Margaret Atwood give a lecture. Attitude, Atwood. Attitude and Atwood share a core sound. And if you've ever seen her speak, you know that she's definitely a woman with an interesting attitude about many topics. The second step is to have your encoding materials prepared. A word like Taidu can be broken down into pieces. Tai and do. And if you use the Magnetic Mary method, you'll have the associations ready to go based on the alphabet. I just thought about Atwood wearing a tie made of doo-doo. For more on using a magnetic alphabet, check out the video in the link descriptions below. Now your third step is to elaborate all of your associations. All of them. Fast associations generally aren't enough. You need to elaborate on them in a multi-sensory way. And we do this through a process called Cape Cogs. Each of the letters stands for one of the magnetic modes. So let me take you through the process with Taidu as an example. The kinesthetic was physically feeling the weight of this tie on Atwood's neck. And the auditory was hearing the sound of her voice, having a bad attitude about the situation. Visual is thinking about what the scene looks like. Now, I don't see pictures in my mind, so I just think about what it would look like if I could see it. And something very ghostly and shimmery comes is good enough. Emotional is experiencing her disgust at having a tie made of doo-doo. Conceptual is the fact that Atwood is an author, and that is conceptual enough. And I add on the idea that her next book is called Attitude, and it's about someone forced to wear a tie made out of doo-doo. The olfactory, well, this is obvious, the smell of the tie is very easy to imagine if it is indeed made out of doo-doo. The gustatory, well, that's obvious too. The taste, yuck. And then spatial. This is where you spend a second thinking about the sizes of things involved in the association. So in my imagination, this tie is rather tiny. Now with practice, using cave cogs should only take seconds. I've memorized names in rooms and it happens that fast. Literally, you hear the name and you can run through them all within seconds. But for a simple exercise, just try to remember that a sound like Thai is in Thai food and do mean attitude in Mandarin Chinese. Come up with your own multi-sensory associations. Don't use mine, your own. Literally push yourself to do it. And then after five minutes, see if you can bring back each association in your mind. All of the cave cogs, all of them, it will help. Now, step four is to purposely bring back those highly personalized associations. And there's no cookie cutter answer for how to do this. Now, Dominic O'Brien suggests the rule of five, but I've never found a specific description of how exactly he does it. And myself, I make sure to just start recalling the information with the rule of five in mind and a little bit more robustness. Now, when I'm learning Chinese, I also get that variety by putting the words into phrases and then having conversations with my wife and seeking other sentences that it's used in. And, you know, if I'm learning history, well, I'll pepper the facts into my writing and conversations. I'll recall in the shower. I'll practice active recall while walking. I apply the recall method in a journal I use for testing. Again, with trying to use multiple sentences, multiple ways of explaining the same thing for variety. And I keep reading more material. I continue listening to more material and so on and so on. The important point is that recall happens in multiple formats and in multiple locations. It really helps that some of the active recall takes place out on walks, for example. Now let's talk about step five, using recall rehearsal. The absolute best way to use active recall is by following patterns that maximize the primacy and recency effects. Now these are the laws of memory that help us build mental connections faster and ensure that they last. This process also harnesses the serial position effect and the von Restorff effect. To use it, you mentally travel in your memory palace using different patterns. On each station of the memory palace, you use active recall to decode your associations and bring back the target information. Now, the patterns are very simple. You go from beginning to end in the memory palace, the end to the beginning, the middle to the end, the middle to the beginning, and then you skip the stations. One, three, five, seven, nine, then back. Ten, eight, six, four, two. And if you keep your memory palaces small or at least segment them, you'll find this process easy and fun to do, and it's incredibly effective. Now. The next step is to use questions. When you're revisiting the memory palaces, exactly how to trigger recall, it can be a silent process. You simply bring the location to mind and let the association you created replay. It's almost like you are the manager of a stage play. Some people think of memory as replaying a movie, but it's not really a movie because it's different every time, right? 
you are the theater manager or the director of a stage play and all your associations that you've personally created are there for you to get back into action, right? And sometimes things don't start up so smoothly when you're a theater director using real associations or real people to act on the stage in your memory palace. And that's where I suggest you learn to use a simple decoding question. What was happening there? Literally ask your mind, what was happening there? Think of the place in the memory palace. And if this question doesn't help you start recalling the information, then you can start self-testing using cave cogs. What was the kinesthetic association I made? What was the auditory association? What was the visual association, etc. Now, usually you won't have to ask too many of these questions. And the questions are a great cheat detector that expose when you've tried to take shortcuts by not using all the magnetic modes built into cave cogs. And when this happens, just add them in. This will probably fix the problem and improve your rate of recall quickly. And then the next step is to develop more advanced approaches. As you develop with these skills, you'll want to be able to encode while reading. Usually, I extract information from books I'm studying onto cards. And I taught this process in our video, How to Memorize a Textbook. But if you want to practice a skill that releases you from this, you can turn each page into a mini memory palace on its own. And you can do this by developing a 00 to 99 PAO, which is a variation on the peg word method. Let's say you're reading away and you encounter a fact. For example, I'm currently reading Adam Zamoyski's Napoleon, the man behind the myth. To remember that Napoleon was born in Corsica, I use page 09 and my image 409 because that's the page where I encountered this fact. Now, my image for 09 is typically Brad Zupp driving a Saab. And to elaborate this image to recall Corsica, I imagine him throwing an apple core out the window. And I place this image not in a traditional memory palace, but at the top of page 9. Now, later, when I want to remember that Napoleon was born in 1769 and died in Longwood in 1821, I can add these facts to the middle and the bottom of that same page. Then, when performing active recall, I have page 9 to easily refer back to as the palette where I painted the associations. Now, although this technique is a bit more advanced, it does not mean you can skip recall rehearsal. You just wind up using it in a slightly different way as you mentally revisit the pages of the books and your associations in them. Now, as we've seen, the memory palace technique is a great way to use active recall. It's a great way to get a lot of variety in there too because you have space for a lot of different things. And it's a great way to make everything highly, deeply, and you might say magnetically personalized. Now to call it an alternative to flashcards and spaced repetition software would be a mistake. The memory palace is not an alternative to this. It's the other way around. Leitner boxes, Anki, Quizlet, and other programs are the modern alternatives to the ancient technique. And do they work as well? Well, they certainly can, provided you engage deeply with the elaborative encoding steps that I've shared with you today. However, I'm confident you'll find they work even better if you strengthen your spatial memory using the memory palace technique. So in sum, here are the takeaways to remember. Active recall studying throughout the day is totally possible. You just need to set up your memory systems. But it's technically not to be called active recall if you're not making highly personal associations with variety that help you recall. And you need to be reading, writing, speaking, and listening in ample doses to make sure you're actively recalling through multiple channels of your mind. So what do you say? Are you ready to approach active recall and spaced repetition in a new way? Thanks as always for the view. This is Anthony Medivier from MagneticMemoryMethod.com. And until we have a chance to speak again, keep yourself magnetic.